Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Kelso Community Conversation on Race and Faith. My name is Helen Blyer. I'm the Director of Continuing Education at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and it's a pleasure to spend this time with you. A brief word, of course, about our online environment, though all of you are undoubtedly very fluent in Zoom at this point. Um, please note that we're meeting in webinar, not room, which explains why you can only see the presenters this evening. Um, please use the Q&A pod at the bottom for questions you would like our guest to respond to at the end of our session. We'll have about 25 minutes of Q&A at the end. So use Q&A for questions you would like our guest to respond to. And use the chat pod to interact. Um, you can create an amen corner. You can uh, name epiphanies that occur to you, anything that you wish. In fact, um, why don't you give the chat pod a test drive right now, say hello and where you are dialing in from. Uh, we would love to see where you all are from. And chat will be, of course, the way you interact with each other. If you have a question, though, make sure you use that Q&A. A word about our series. Over the past year, many of us have been using the word pandemics in the plural. Speaking of course about COVID-19, but also about the pandemic of systemic racism that would no longer be ignored after the murder of George Floyd last summer by a Minneapolis police officer. For seven years, our Kelso conversation has explored why faith communities should respond to systemic racism and how they can. The series was created in response to the murders of Michael Brown and Eric Garner by police officers who were not indicted by grand juries for what they did. These conversations have sought to ask of, uh, of each other and of our communities how can we hold each other accountable to the recognition, repentance, and reconciliation of the sin of systemic racism, a sin in which the church has played no small part? So here we are with our series begun with the last words of Eric Garner, I can't breathe, words that were echoed by George Floyd, I can't breathe, in the middle of a health crisis, that quite literally threatens to take our breath away. Breath that is a sign of life and today a grave danger at the same time. We remind ourselves that we are all connected. The breath of God manifested in the simple fact that what I exhale, you inhale, which is why we have to meet remotely this year. Our Kelso conversation then takes on a new form this year as a weekly Bible study that you can participate in now or use at a future date in your communities and congregations. We are recording the series to enable you to do that. These days we're living in have been called apocalyptic, which some interpret to mean end times, but more aptly, the word refers to unveiling. And one of the great unveilings has been the growing socioeconomic schisms exacerbated by the pandemic and often falling along racialized lines as well. Too often people of faith say, this is no concern to us because we are committed to matters of the spirit or the well-being of our own. These things are not ours to respond to, they are God's. But our guest tonight will help us walk through the scripture texts that are often used to support these positions and teach us a way to lean into these texts that underscores the care of poor and the suffering and the work of justice as integrally a part of our responsibility as Christians. The Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is the director of the Kairos Center and a founder and coordinator of the Poverty Initiative and is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Dr. William Barber. She has spent the last two decades organizing amongst the poor in the US, working with various grassroots organizations, including unions and coalitions of the poor. She's animated by a theologically grounded conviction that poverty can be ended and the poor can be agents of social change. 
She received her PhD from Union Theological Seminary in New Testament and Christian origins, and she's the author of Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor. Liz is also an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church. We are so privileged to have her sharing her scripture scholarship and her commitments and her passions with us throughout this month-long series. Liz, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I've got a couple of questions just to help locate you and the work that you do to provide a context for our evening together. Um, many people on the call are likely familiar with the Poor People's Campaign, National Call for Moral Revival, but are less familiar with the Cairo Center. Can you tell us a bit about what the center does, what its scope of work and origins and mission are? Um, bonus points, too, if you can tell us about how the center might be a good resource for res more initiative-driven people who might want to take their communities further down this road. Well, thank you so much, indeed. So the Cairo Center formed in the fall of 2013, but builds off of a decade more of work that we were doing at Union Theological Seminary. And our mission is to raise up generations of, of leaders, of religious leaders, of community leaders that are dedicating to building a movement to confront and overcome and end systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and this distorted, this false narrative of uh, religious and in particular Christian nationalism. Um, and we, we use a rights approach. You know, we look at, at ways that religion and human rights are, are there as, as tools, as um, resources for, for building and emboldening powerful movements from below. Uh, the theory of change that we have is that uh, it's gonna take more than one program, one policy, mm -hmm. one ministry, to, to overcome the great chasms in society that you were just speaking about. Um, it's gonna take a movement. Um, and that movements are most successful when those who are most impacted by injustice are in the forefront. Not just telling sad stories, not just uh, you know, coming along for the ride, but actually with a political, a moral, epistemological agency. Um, and that also movements are only successful when they're rooted not in one faith, but with this arc of justice um, that extends across faiths um, and with moral leaders in that work as moral standard bearers. Um, and so we, we formed and our mission at the very onset was to build a Poor People's Campaign for today. That was five years before we launched the current Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And mm -hmm. each of those five years was spent and the decades before uh, going to communities, connecting up with grassroots leaders, hearing the cry that we want to be free, um, and then figuring out how to weave together a powerful state-based grassroots network uh, committed to overcoming these injustices. Um, we, we knew that as we approached the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign that welfare rights leaders and Dr. King and so many others had given their lives for, um, that the only way to honor that was to, to actually reach back and pick up that work and carry it the next steps of the way. And so uh, I hope that folks do uh, check out the Cairo Center. We have a website and we're about to have a new one, but you can go to kairoscenter.org um, and it's Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. Um, and you can find a whole series of, of resources, of, of sermons, of Bible studies, of analysis, um, of articles, of policy briefings, but particularly for, for folk in congregations that are trying to come up with what is it gonna take for us to engage with the injustices in our society and, and build a, a larger moral movement. And so um, I also would invite people if you're interested that the Cairo Center has, has launched a, a new church. Um, it's called the Freedom Church of the Poor and mm -hmm. we worship on Sunday evenings and, and all are welcome. It, it, it tries not to interfere with other worship. Um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's really a, a movement church, you know, grassroots struggles, you know, sharing their experiences. And so I, I hope that people can get involved. Wonderful. We've dropped the URL into the chat pod for those of you who are read, are participating. Um, please grab that URL and look up these resources. Um, this is a good segue in terms of contemporary responses to what's happening. 
Um, listening to the news, we hear about the proposed aid package for COVID relief. We hear about the eviction moratorium, um, so on. Help us put all of this into context. Um, tell us something about the impact the pandemic has had on the poor, the most vulnerable, the marginalized in our communities who are already suffering before the virus hit. Yeah, so even before the pandemic hit, we were living in a nation that is the richest nation in human history. Um, and yet 140 million people uh, were, were poor or one storm, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, uh, one other emergency. We had all of those um, away from economic ruin. That's close to half of the US population. And that was before the pandemic. What's happened in this pandemic and in the economic recession that has accompanied it um, is, is that the, the most impacted by, uh, by COVID, by job loss, by you know, uh, closure and by homelessness, by eviction, are, are the poor and the marginalized. Um, you know, actually the richest in our society have, have made a trillion dollars in the midst of this yeah. pandemic. But the bottom 45% of families that were making $40,000 or less have lost uh, significant income. Um, and, and now we have literally tens of millions of people on the brink of eviction if those moratoriums don't keep on getting extended. Um, uh, what we're seeing is, is, is pretty unprecedented, even, even if you look at the broad swath of US history um, uh, and, and who again is suffering and who does not need to be suffering, right? We have the resources, you know, the first week that the pandemic was, was uh, named such, um, the Federal Reserve materialized $1.5 trillion overnight, right? To bail out Wall Street. Um, and yet we're here again debating whether the poorest in our society deserve even a little bit when the rich are just running away with everything. And so, you know, this is this is a moment that indeed does unveil um, the injustices. You know, we we our public health experts say to us, you know, that that these issues um, and 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 pandemics, um, epidemics, public health crises, always. Uh, spread through the fissures that already existed in society. And what were those fissures, racism and poverty that have only gotten worse? Yeah. How did you get um, so passionately committed to this work? Yeah, so I was raised in a family um, that believed that, uh, uh, in the words of Micah 6, you know, what does the Lord require of you? Uh, but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. And so I was always raised to see that my faith had to be linked to doing social justice in the world um, and, and have myself, you know, experienced poverty, have experienced homelessness, have experienced low wage work and, and the lack of health care and, and have also been able to, to connect up and join a, a movement um, that is being led by those that are most impacted. And so, you know, for the past more than 25 years, every day I wake up, it's in a movement. Um, and it's with thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people across this country who have nothing to lose but their faith and um, and and the, the injustice of the status quo and are therefore, you know, organizing and struggling. And so, you know, I, I've been blessed to, to get to spend a bunch of time you know, working uh, alongside of, of powerful people, um, you know, to try to bring God's reign of justice here on earth. Well, we are really excited to see what you're going to be uh, challenging us with this evening. Our text tonight is Matthew 26, 6 through 13. Um, I will go ahead and leave you with our guests tonight. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, I saw in the and the message that people are having a little trouble hearing, I hope that you can hear me okay. Uh, but please uh, send a message um, uh, if, if you can't. I, again, am so excited to be with you all. Um, and I chose this passage um, that we will look at over the next hour and, uh, and then some, uh, because uh, there hasn't been a week in my life over the past 25 years when I talk about the work of ending poverty, of ending racism, that somebody doesn't come forward to say, well, 
if God wanted to end poverty, he would do so. Or poverty might be inevitable, it might be unfortunate, but it's inevitable. Um, and so uh, I have spent a lot of, of time trying to look at this passage and other passages that are used really as text um, to kind of become barriers to, to social justice when, when really what I, I believe, um, and many scholars can back this up, uh, that this passage and so many other are saying is that that is actually uh, a commandment for us to, to, to build a movement and to, to end poverty. So I wanna pull up the first slide um, uh, and, and do a little bit of storytelling. Um, this, pass, uh, this poster, um, this image that you can see, uh, I was introduced to uh, back in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, when I was organizing amongst welfare rights uh, leaders and, and homeless leaders. And, um, and, and it really resonated with us. Uh, you know, this, this idea that how can you worship a homeless man on Sunday? Indeed, Jesus was homeless. Um, you know, we have passages to back that up, uh, not just when he was a baby and had no place to lay his head, but as he was a, a grown person um, and despite working as a carpenter um, still says, you know, birds of the air have nests and, and foxes have dens, but, um, but the son of man, uh, human beings uh, here uh, are, are the ones that are homeless. And so how can you worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And, and so I want us to kind of sit with that a little bit um, and to, to, to see that as a challenge to then some of the, the, um, the other kind of basic ideas and kind of common sense that, that exists in our, in our life today that says inst instead that, that Jesus is against poverty, that, that he, um, he thought it was always gonna be with us. So I'll, I'll, the next slide um, has um, the, the passage that we're gonna look at. And, and we, could, we could look from earlier in Matthew, we could go later, but, but we'll, we'll focus on this for copy today. Um, now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, why this waste? This ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? She has performed a good service for me. You always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. I'll let us uh, sit in that and then right to the next slide. Um, we have a saying in the work that that we do at the Cairo Center, that the Bible is perhaps the only or surely one of the most important uh, forms of mass media that has something good to say about the poor. Uh, the Bible is one of the only forms of mass media that has something good to say about the poor. The Bible is itself a, a widely read, a widely distributed, a translated into so many languages book, right? In the United States and across the world. You know, if, if you look at the bestseller list, right? It's, it's, it's always there. Um, you know, it's in our hotel rooms and it's, uh, if you're riding on the subway of New York, like I often do, it's, it's what's in many people's purses and hands. Uh, it's, it's cited for lots of stances. It's consulted for personal and social decisions that many people make. It's a, it's a form of mass media. And, and then there's this passage um, that we're gonna look at tonight. It's what Jim Wallace calls the most famous passage on poverty in the Bible. Um, the poor will be with you always. Uh, Despite the fact that if you start in Genesis and you move all the way to Revelation, there are 2,000 to 2,500 passages that are talking about good news to the poor and release to the captive. Um, uh, what most people spend their time doing is using this text 
as an excuse to to um, to to see that that uh, as an excuse to to say that poverty is inevitable, but but eternal. Um, you know, I, I'll I'll regularly do Google searches like this one that I did one particular day. Uh, this one, I there were seven hundred twenty eight thousand mentions um, of of when you look at the poor will be with you always. It's 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 everywhere. It's uh, it's it touches so many different aspects of life, but when you start to read those those mentions, and no, I, I don't read all hundreds of thousands every time I do, but but when I read hundreds or even thousands of these mentions, you start to see this kind of debate emerging emerging on the role of Jesus and on the Bible, and on on the role that faith communities are to play in the eradication or the amelioration or the maintenance, in fact, of of poverty. We can go to the next slide. So I, I want to kind of characterize um, those those kind of uh, interpretations of a kind of common interpretations of the of this passage um, in in basically three different ways. Um, a, a lot of times, those entries, you know, kind of have these personal assertions or 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 reflections. Um, but but in most of them, uh, there are these basic assumptions. The first is that we can never end poverty, um, that poverty is always going to be with us, that that's what is being said when you hear this passage. The second is that it's not the role of government. It's not the role of society. It's the role of Christians or Christian institutions to try to take care of the poor. Um, and uh, and then the, the third kind of assertion or interpretation or reflection um, or line of argument is that um, you know, who, who's really supposed to be our concern? Who's really the focus of this passage and of the Bible and of our faith is Jesus, not the poor. And a kind of counter uh, posing uh, uh, of, of, of Jesus and the poor. Um, so, so let's look at the next slide. Um, and, and so I wanna kind of, I want us to, to divide these ideas into kind of four themes. Um, and, and again, this is not just popular culture. I was talking about Google, but then, you know, when I look at biblical scholars, when I look at um, other, other folks that are, are looking at this passage or, and using it both as a proof text and as a kind of key to, to understanding what the Bible says about poverty, uh, there are these, these kind of four ideas that emerge. Um, uh, so the, the first is spiritualizing, right? That, that everything in the Bible and everything to do with, with, with the poor is, is about heaven. It's not about the material reality of people here on earth. Um, when, when in fact, uh, so much of the Bible is actually about uh, God hating poverty and, and willing um, people um, to, to live uh, like beautiful lives, thriving lives. Um, the, the second is ritualizing, right? This idea that there's all of this ritual around Jesus's death um, and that Jesus counts more than the poor. Um, then there's this idea of kind of individualizing, um, that, that the way we're supposed to address poverty is the way that the disciples suggest to in the passage, individual charity, almsgiving, you know, um, uh, handouts, one, one-on-one -on -one kind of responses. Um, uh, to, to these issues and, and then moralizing, right? Um, that, that we're supposed to help the poor because poor people can't help themselves. And if they were really in a right relationship with Jesus, with God, that, um, that people wouldn't be poor in the first place. Um, uh, and so, so I, I just wanted us to kind of unearth some of those assumptions um, because I think they're there all the time. Um, so for a long time, uh, uh, we can come off the slides. We're about to watch a short video, um, uh, but I, I have a couple more things to say. For a long time, I um, uh, I wanted to just kind of ignore this passage. Um, you know, there's so many other ones that are about blessed are the poor, or you know, what you do to the least of these. Um, you know, and and so many other you know, woe unto you who pass unjust laws, or or the the wages you fail to pay your workers are crying out against you. I wanted to just kind of ignore this. Um, I wanted to say, you know, even if that's what Jesus was saying, um, there's so many other passages. But but 
But what I want to say to folks to, to this evening um, and here is that uh, that we, we can't ignore this passage. Um, and in fact, when we dive into it in a more deep way, what we find is perhaps the most radical um, teaching on poverty in the entire Bible. Um, so I invite you into, into studying this passage with me this evening. To do so, I wanna first start with a, a brief video that we produced out of the Cairo Center and the Poor People's Campaign um, uh, that folks can actually find on the Poor People's Campaign website. Um, it's, a, it's called Poverty is Violence, and it's only about a minute long, but I think it'll ground us for the, the Bible work we're about to do together. A lot of children are going to their bed hungry for a country this rich to have so many people homeless, a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and wrong. So my name is Gigi, I'm from Vocal, New York. I'm homeless, I've been homeless for the past year. We're tired of being pushed out, kicked out, and priced out of our community. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being priced out of my community. I'm joining the Poor People's Campaign to say, our people are suffering and we will not take it anymore. Are you with me, my people? We must say, this is not right. This is not moral. The people who are hurting the most have linked up to say, we won't be silent anymore. children. So I'm going to have us read the passage from Matthew 26 one more time, and then we'll spend a little time uh, walking through it. Um, you know, I encourage folks, uh, I, I chose in this PowerPoint to, to use uh, the NRSV, but I encourage folks to, to use uh, many different um, uh, interpretations and translations of the Bible. Um, uh, and, and, and being a biblical scholar, I actually ask that people at times uh, make sure that you read the message version because sometimes it puts an urgency there that, that sometimes I think we, we kind of gloss over. But, but here we have Matthew 26. Listen to these words. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment. She poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, why this waste? This ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money could have been given to the poor. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. I think we'll, uh, we can take down the video for a minute and I can just uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, and how I often like to look at, at our, our text is by actually a reading kind of line by line. Uh, so we start this text. Uh, what's happened in Matthew 26 from before is uh, Jesus has, has gathered and he uh, is, is been just teaching a lot. And uh, he's been saying these things like uh, Matthew 25, um, uh, the story of of the last judgment, um, when, when this king says to the nations that are assembled around him, that what you do to the homeless, what you do to the hungry, what you do to those without health care, what do you do to those that are in prison, what you do to those who are crying out that they cannot breathe, is what you have done to God. Um, and, and then we open into Matthew 26, and uh, there are two gatherings going on. Jesus is gathering with the disciples, 
but the chief priests and the elders and those that are working with the Roman authorities um, in Jerusalem are also gathering. They've gathered because uh, they start to see that Jesus and this movement are a threat, a threat to, to the larger status quo. And, and they're worried about it. Um, so they talk about what they should do and they say, maybe we shouldn't come and get him during, uh, during this moment of the Passover. You know, the Passover was a, a, a moment. It was a liberation festival. It was a freedom festival. It was a protest movement. Um, and it was a memory, an anniversary, a celebration of, of the fact that people have had to, to, to struggle for liberation before. Um, and so then they're gathered again um, and, and they're still in justice and, and folks are, uh, are ready to keep on organizing. And so then we have this story, Jesus being in Bethany. Uh, at the house of Simon the leper. Now, he, right before this, has gone into the temple, um, which was not just the religious center of his day, but is actually the economic and political center as well. Um, uh, the temple, that is actually the place where the debt records of all society is being kept. Um, and in the Jewish wars that happen, you know, uh, some years later, uh, the first thing that happens is that people go in and, and start to burn those debt records, because that's how impoverished. That's how indebted society is. So he's gone into this temple and he's turned over the tables, right? Uh, he's engaged in, in holy disruption, in nonviolent civil disobedience. And that's what it was. Um, and then he's had to run, run to Bethany um, to kind of uh, avoid the authorities and to not get into as much trouble. And it's important to see that, that, that Bethany, um, it's, it's a real town. It's about 12 miles from Jerusalem. Probably he and his disciples walked there. Um, uh, and, and Bethany in Hebrew means house, bet, ani, of the poor. Um, in, in that society, in that time, it was a poor neighborhood. Uh, it was, you know, kind of a ghetto. Um, and, and here you have Jesus in the house of the poor, um, in the house of Simon the leper. What we know about lepers is that uh, they're considered ritually unclean. Um, many folks will have, if they did have resources in the first place, have spent them all trying to figure out how to kind of cure this disease and have probably gotten very ostracized, very marginalized. Um, many biblical scholars remind us that actually part of the healing of lepers isn't so much just the curing of their disease, but the welcoming of people back into community. And, and here Jesus is in this high holy days and this Passover festival in this house of Simon the leper. And a woman comes to him and she has this jar, this very fancy jar. Uh, the passage reads, and if, if you have your Bibles in front of you, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment. Now that's like four or five words in the Greek. Um, that are just saying really, really, really expensive. Um, and uh, the ointment, the Greek word for ointment here is myron. Uh, myron is, is actually a holy anointing oil. The recipe for it happens in the Exodus. Um, it's given to Aaron in order to be able to anoint priests and prophets and messiahs. Um, and there are some various moments where Moran shows back up in our Bible. Um, and it's always about um, conferring leadership um, on, on prophetic leaders, on a messiahs, on those that are set apart by God to organize society around the needs of the poor. So this woman comes in and she has this Moran um, and it's in this jar that she has to break in order to pour it on his head. And that's what she does. She pours it on his head as he's sitting there at the table. Now this act of pouring Muran on the head of a person, this is the only thing that is needed to make somebody um, anointed. And anointing is really important um, to our Christian tradition. Um, uh, Christ is, is the Greek for the anointed one. Um, and Christ is the Greek for the Hebrew Messiah um, for the the one who is set apart by God to organize society around the needs of the poor. So what happens, you know, just in the first two sentences of, of this passage 
is that Jesus has shown up in the house of the poor, in the house of a leper, and he's been anointed as Christ. That's what's taken place. It's, it's hugely significant. There's nowhere else in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're reading this passage in Matthew. We can talk about the differences of, of Mark and Luke and John's versions. But in Matthew, there is no other place in the entire Gospel where Jesus is anointed. Um, this is it. Um, this is, so this is really significant. And then we get to see what the disciples think about it because they respond they're angry and they say, you know, in our translations, why this waste? But in the Greek, why this destruction? Why did you just destroy this moron? Um, now, uh, this, is, this is pretty serious. Um, uh, you know, and, and then they can, I can continue, right? And they say, you know, this moron, this ointment, this moron could have been sold for a large sum. Um, and, and if we were reading uh, Mark's gospel, uh, we would hear how much money this was worth. They, they say it was worth about 300 denarii, um, which is about uh, a years of workers' wages. Um, it's, it's hard for us to actually really realize what that means. I mean, uh, is it, these, are, these are kind of more day laborers. These are, are poorer workers' wages. Um, so, but it's, it's a huge sum of money, right? And especially to those that would be gathered here, the disciples and those that are followers of, of Jesus and, and Simon the leper himself, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a lot of resources. Um, uh, and, and again, we should remember that, that, that we're, we're in the community of people that don't have many resources. So, so they are like this, why did you just destroy this? You could have sold this for a large sum. You could have given the money to the poor, right? Now, we now are, are kind of already accustomed and trained to, to be against the disciples. But, but let's actually put ourselves in the situation of the disciples. Um, you know, they've been traveling with Jesus for some time now. They, they've been hearing the teachings about what you're supposed to do about poverty for some time now. And, and so their, their reaction that, that maybe we should be caring for the poor and not just having this extravagant, you know, ointment poured over, over him. Uh, maybe that's not what he wants, right? Maybe that's not the best, you know, way for us to, to use our resources. Um, uh, so so I, again, before we're kind of too harsh on these disciples, I think we, we probably are actually the disciples in this, in this passage. Um, now, now, who does this kind of challenging in John's gospel is um, actually Judas. Um, and, and it says actually in John's gospel that Judas was the keeper of the money box. He was the treasurer. Um, and then he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he used to steal from it, right? Um, so that, that gives us a, an idea as well. Um, this idea of, of people making money off of, of the poor um, isn't just something that happens in our day. It's, it's clearly something that, that Judas is being critiqued for, um, you know, 2000 years ago. But, but, you know, in Matthew, again, we have just uh, that it could have been sold for a large sum and then the money could have been given to the poor. I think we have to say one, one or two more words about, about this. Um, this idea that this money could have been sold for a large sum. Uh, so Muron is, is a luxury item. Um, it, it, it isn't just show up in the Exodus um, to be this holy anointing oil. Another place where it shows up in our Bible is in the list that's in Revelation 18 of these luxury goods, um, you know, fine linens, um, all kinds of gold and, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, all the purple cloth, you know, these beautiful things. Um, and also in that cargo list is Maran. And at the end of it is the bodies and souls of human beings. Um, so what we remember is going on is that where you would sell something like Muron is in the same kind of marks, markets, the same kind of luxury markets that, that human beings are being sold in an, into slavery. In. And, and so we should hear that actually as a critique that, that, um, that, that in order to be able to make money to kind of give the proceeds to the poor, even back then, 
you have to engage in economic practices that are actually impoverishing other people. And so, you know, so often with this passage, uh, we, we hear um, this kind of response, um, this idea of kind of making a lot of money or getting a lot of money, whatever way we can, and then, um, you know, giving the proceeds to the poor. That's how we're taught still in our day and age to respond to poverty. Um, but Jesus has a response to that. It says Jesus aware of this, right? He knew, he knows already what people's, you know, questions and, and issues are going to be. He says to them, why do you trouble this woman? And in fact, when, when he uses the, the Greek words of this passage of why do you trouble, it's, it's why are you trying to get in trouble? Why are you trying to uh, mess around? Why are you trying to get her in trouble with the authorities? In fact, like, why are you trying to turn her over to the cops? Um, she's performed a good service for me, a, a good work, a mitzvah, right? This is, this is what, what is being said in this passage. Um, and then he continues to this very famous line, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, so probably if you have a study Bible, um, you, you might see that, that this text from Matthew 26, 11, especially the first half of 11, for you always have the poor with you. Um, and there's different translations of it, right? Um, so the NRSV says, for you always have the poor with you. Um, other translations say you will always have, right? And, and there's a difference there and we should notice that difference. Um, if we look at the Greek, it's, it's closer to the NRSV. It's, it's more saying the poor are with you always, um, that, that's, that they're here, not, not predicting it, not, not willing it to be, um, but, but you'll have the poor with you always. Um, but, but you also will see that that's a, a quote of a text from Deuteronomy. Now, many Christian scholars will say that Matthew 26, 11 is quoting Deuteronomy 15, 11. Um, and, and, and that part of Deuteronomy 15, which we'll, we'll get to in one second, is, is, about, um, is, a, is about the fact that the poor will never cease to be in the land. The poor will be with you always. Um, but what the Jewish publication services tell us is that that, that that quote for the poor will always be with you is actually uh, also a reference to De Deuteronomy 15, four, um, which is that there need be no needy among you um, if, if you follow my commandments today. So I'm gonna have us pull up the, the next slide, which is, is Deuteronomy 15, four through 11, because I think it's important for us to actually look at this um, when Jesus, uh, again, is, is talking about um, the poor will be with you always. He's referring to back to a, 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 a Hebrew text, um, a Hebrew biblical text um, that even if we aren't familiar with, um, his disciples and, and those following him would be. So if we could put the, the slideshow back up and, and the next slide that was uh, the one following the last one we saw, um, that would be great. One of the things I want to say as we're, we're doing this is that um, if we start at, um, at, uh, at 15, one and two, um, uh, and, and again, I, I encourage people to, to go back to Deuteronomy and, and read the whole thing, um, is what Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament um, scholar says, is the most radical part of the Bible that basically nobody knows anything about. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and what, what 15, one and two and three say is, is that if you um, forgive debts, um, if you release slaves, if you pay workers what they need um, and what they deserve, and if you lend out money knowing you'll never get paid back again, uh, this is what will happen. There will, however, be no one in need among you because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession to occupy. If only you obey the Lord your God by diligently observing this entire commandment. If there is anyone among you in need, a member of your community in any of the towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving to you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather 
open your hand willingly, lending enough to meet their need, whatever it may be, since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth. I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor. So what I, what I think is really important about this passage is that Jesus is re referencing the Deuteronomic code. He's reminding people that God's plan is to end poverty. That whether it starts with the manna in the wilderness or whether we get to the Jubilee and Sabbath codes that are contained in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that there, it is not God's will that there is anyone in need. Um, and if we follow the commandments that God has given, and those commandments again are to forgive debts, to release slaves, to pay people what they deserve, to organize society around the needs of the poor and to lend out money knowing that you may never get paid back again, that your whole society will flourish um, and, and, and you'll never have to borrow from anybody. You'll always be a, a nation that is prosperous. That, that in our work, we often will say that the Deuteronomy is, is talking about how kind of moral, uh, moral policy moral structures is actually good economics that that when you lift from the bottom when you make sure that that the society and the economy works for the poorest of the poor then you lift everybody up and and that's what is being referenced in deuteronomy 15 when matthew um when when in in matthew or in mark or in john or in a different kind of version in luke uh, is talking about the poor will be with you always um and, and so, so to me, this, this kind of breaks open um, this whole passage. Um, can, we, can we go to the, 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 the slide before and, and we'll just look again at Matthew 26 a little bit. So, so we just had the kind of climax of, of this passage, the poor you will always have with you. Again, as a reminder, not that God wills poverty, but that if we fail to follow God's commandments, that the poor will always be with you. The poor will never cease to be in the land. You know, kind of a translation of it is that like, I know that you're a greedy people that, that will not follow these commandments. You won't do um, uh, what, what God has said we must do to end poverty. Um, and so then therefore uh, poverty will, will be with us. Um, and then we kind of continue, but you will not always have me. And this is a shift um, where, it's, it's a really important part of, of the passage where, again, we're being reminded that Jesus is about to be killed, um, that he um, is, uh, and, and how is he going to be killed? He's going to be killed not as a common criminal, not as someone who, you know, uh, is a robber. Um, he's going to be killed by crucifixion, and crucifixion is reserved for those who dare to challenge the empire, dare to organize a movement that could overthrow empire and put in a reign of justice for everybody. Um, and so, so, you know, at this point, this is, this is a turning point in the, in the, in the story um, because this is Jesus telling these disciples, he's tried to say it before, but, but it, it rings differently here. You will not always have me. And then she, he says, by pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Now I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, again, anointing. So we already talked about how anointing is to, to, to set apart uh, by God um, messiahs, to set apart by God priests and prophets who are gonna organize a movement um, from the bottom up. Uh, to, to transform society around God's will, which is that all should, should thrive and not just barely survive. Um, and, and, and then now we're also being reminded of other aspects of what anointing is. Anointing um, with Moran happens also when, um, when royalty uh, is, 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 has died. Um, and so, and it's, and it's something that is, again, about recognizing and honoring. Um, and one of the things we know about crucifixion is that, you know, the whole point of it is to, is to humiliate, um, is to, um, you know, not let people honor. 
And so here you have um, this woman, you know, anointing his body with, with what it is, what it takes for, for someone who is so special. I mean, here you have Jesus being cared for in a passage when usually Jesus is the one that's caring for everyone else. Um, the other kind of use of anointing and, and Muran um, that is also kind of being referenced here is, is anointing the poor, that the poor deserve good things, that, that, that luxury items are not to be reserved only for uh, those that have the wealth and resources to get them, but that, and so there's all of these beautiful anointings with Muran in Isaiah and in other prophetic texts that are about, um, again, you know, that, that we deserve to thrive, that, that we, uh, that, that all, including the poor, you know, should, should have the right, again, to live and to beautiful things. Um, you know, it makes me think of, of, of Luke 1, um, Mary's Magnificat, where the poor are filled with good things, right? This like beautiful, um, this, this luxury that everybody deserves. Um, and so here again, there's this other kind of anointing that's taking place. This woman is caring for Jesus um, and he has a response. He says, truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world. So let's pause for a minute. Um, we, we know that truly, I tell you, it's, it's, it's an awesome, um, oh, you know, a phrase of Jesus's. Um, wherever this good news, now, um, good news, uh, good news, gospel, right? Good news, uh, the Greek word evangelion, um, you know, it's where evangelical comes from. Now, in Matthew, there is no mention of good news, of gospel, evangelion, um, that one word, anywhere in Matthew, where it is not linked um, directly to doing justice and justice for the poor. And what is good news to the poor, if that's what's being referenced in this passage? Good news to the poor is ending poverty. It's ending eviction. It's ending the lack of health care. Um, and it's a very material reality. It's, it's, it's the, the prayer that Jesus, this, that Jesus teach, teaches, right? Um, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts um, on earth as it is in heaven, right? It's, it's this that we all deserve. Everybody's got a right to live, right? And, and so wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now, so we should also notice this, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now, we, we would expect with, with, a, with a text like that, that, um, that what should be being told is in mem memory of him, right? We are, we're being reminded of our communion liturgy. We're being reminded here of, of the fact that we do things in memory of, of Jesus, um, our Lord, our Savior. But here he's saying, we're going to do this in remembrance of her. Now, there's a couple of things that are really important about this. One, do we remember anything about this woman? No. I mean, she doesn't have a name. She comes out of nowhere. We, we have no idea um, uh, who she is, except for that the, the disciples are pretty mad at her. Um, you know, many scholars will actually, will, will actually assert that, that, that this woman could have been um, a prostitute, um, that maybe she actually got this you know, jar of very costly ointment by stealing or by um, making some money, uh, but not in a, in a way that other people would, would, uh, uh, would necessarily approve of. Um, you know, there's other folks that will say, well, she's a, a wealthy woman who has this and, and she's bringing it here. Um, uh, but either way, we, we, we don't know anything about this woman, right? This woman has no name. And, and how are we going to do things in remembrance of her if we don't know who she is? Um, I, I want to suggest a couple things here. One is that when we do this in remembrance of her um, and, and we don't know who she is, that, that this could actually be challenging um, often the way that charity is done. A lot of times, you know, we'll... we'll we'll build buildings and we'll put, you know, rich people's names on it. Or in our churches, we'll have benches um, 
and pews that have people's names on it, you know. Uh, but here, without having her name, you know, what she has done and doing in a remembrance of her is, isn't about her getting ahead or her being recognized or her being lifted up. It's about, you know, again, proclaiming this good news, this good news to the poor. But I think perhaps the thing that's most important about this, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her is that it's reminding us that actually the genesis of that communion liturgy, the, the genesis of what we do when we break bread and drink wine together as, as people of faith and as Christians um, is actually reminding us that it harkens back to a, a tradition um, that actually preceded Jesus, where the early Christian communities, the early ecclesia, were actually often burial associations. They were actually often um, uh, gatherings where poor people who were too poor to die um, and be buried and remembered, you know, pooled their resources and gathered together. Um, and and what, what folk did was um, commit to each other that when they died, they would be remembered. Um, that folks would figure out pooling their money together and, and burying them, um, but also at a meal together on a regular basis, they would lift a glass and they would um, say, we're doing this in remembrance of. And it was a tradition to carry on both freedom struggles of, of the prophets um, who had come before, as well as other, other poor people that were out there fighting for their lives and fighting to build a movement that actually uh, said no to death and yes to life. And so um, here we have in this passage, um, Jesus reminding us that, that, um, that, that we're a part of a tradition that, that comes out of mutual solidarity amongst the poor. And that is all about um, organizing society and, and building a movement from, from the bottom up. Uh, so, so that's a lot. Um, I, I want to make a couple of other uh, points about this passage. Um, you know, I, I really truly believe that, um, that this passage is, is saying that it is not God's will that, that um, everybody uh, that there is any poverty, um, not uh, God's commandments. Um, in fact, it's disobedience to God's commandments. That it is not God's will. It is not what Jesus is saying is that we should just have, have charity um, and earn a lot of money and then give the proceeds to the poor, but that we have to you know, question and challenge the structures that have um, created poverty uh, uh, in the first place. And so if we could go... Um, two slides or kind of three slides ahead. Um, I want to um, uh, I want to have us kind of end thinking a little bit, uh, sorry, one more, um, about um, the Reverend Dr. King. Uh, we're obviously at the very beginning of Black History Month. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, we uh, celebrated um, Dr. King's birthday. Um, this is a, an image of him. Um, at the Riverside Church in New York, um, which is very close to where I am, um, where he's actually at a meeting of uh, clergy and laity concerned about the Vietnam War and, um, and, and the place where he, he delivers his Beyond uh, Vietnam speech um, and, and where he kind of comes out saying that there are these triple evils of racism, of militarism and of poverty and that the Achilles heel, the weak point of those systems, those three evils is to unite and organize the poor um, uh, into a powerful movement. And, and I wanna suggest that if we can go to the next slide, that this quote um, that he starts in um, Beyond Vietnam and then he continues in his book, The Trumpet of Conscience is actually perhaps his own interpretation of this Matthew 26 text. Um, he says, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day, 
we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. I wanna suggest that this, path, this, this line, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar, that it's not just uh, making some money and giving the proceeds to the poor. It's not just taking that moron and selling it in the market where um, slaves are sold um, and then giving some money to the poor. That is not Jesus's answer to, to structural racism and to structural poverty. Instead, coming to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Instead, it's about anointing first Jesus as a Messiah to organize society, to, to restructure an empire, right? That, that is producing beggars um, into a empire of God where there is no poverty. Um, uh, and and that, that this is actually what, what we're learning in the passage from Matthew. Um, that, that again, um, it does not have to be this way. Um, and if we, if we look at, for instance, uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew um, that Helen so beautifully uh, opened with um, uh, when she was talking about um, this idea uh, of people not being able to breathe, whether it was George Floyd being killed or whether it was um, folks that are, are suffocating to death because of COVID. Um, and, and I'm not sure she knew that, that I heard a reference to Matthew and the Beatitudes there. But what I heard was um, Matthew's version in Matthew 6 of blessed are you who are poor in breath. A lot of times we hear that passage um, poor in spirit, but the word is ruach, which actually means in breath. And so I think I would suggest actually that that passage is blessed are you who cry out, I can't breathe. Um, cause, cause yours is the empire, the Basileia, the kingdom, not of Rome, not of these United States, not of empire, but the empire of God, the God who led the people out of Egypt, the God who said in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that if you uh, organize society around the needs of the poor, that you can indeed um, address these issues. Um, the God who throughout the prophets says, woe to you who pass on just laws. The God who, who shows up in this text and throughout the gospel saying, the spirit of God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news, not bad news, good news to the poor um, and, and to, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to proclaim Jubilee, to proclaim that there need be no poor among you if you follow these commandments of God. I want us to watch, uh, before we get into the Q&A, uh, another short video. This one is uh, a music video uh, based on a song that we sing all the time at the Cairo Center and in the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and it's, it's everybody's, it's, it's somebody's been hurting our brother. Somebody's been hurting our sister. Somebody's been hurting our people and it's gone on for far too long and we can't be silent anymore. This song that we're about to learn is a song that's entitled, Somebody's Hurting My Brother. Now this song was actually born in a town hall meeting around coal ash. And the meeting came about because Duke Energy was spilling coal ash into poor black and brown and poor white neighborhoods. After hearing testimony after testimony of people who were impacted physically and mentally by the coal ash, this song came as an inspiration of those testimonies. So I'll call to you, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on and your response is far too long. Yes, it's gone on. Far too long. It's gone on. 
far too long. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Now the end is, and we won't be silent anymore. We'll say that together. And, and we won't be silent anymore. Okay? And so we'll try the rehearsal version, which goes. Oh, oh, oh somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you it's gone on far too long. And it's gone on far too long together, and we won't be silent anymore. Now we're going to put a little rhythm to this, okay? Okay? We're going to speed it up just a little bit. Not too fast. We've just, uh, I had to compose myself and get myself back in my chair after that. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Uh, we've got some great questions. Um, I want to start off with, people want some clarification around neuron. What is the Hebrew word? Is it the same as mer, et cetera? Could you say a little bit more about it? Yeah, it, there's so much to say. And, and I do actually, um, uh, I have written a whole book on this passage. And so I, I can't even remember how long I, there's definitely a chapter basically all on Moran. So, so, yes. um, so the, the Hebrew for Moran is basically more, which is often translated than mer, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so it is, it is all kind of connected. And one of the ingredients in Moran, this kind of mm -hmm. holy anointing oil that shows up in the Exodus with, with this recipe, and then is, is used to anoint David and to anoint other prophets and priests and, and kings um, and rulers, um, you know, it has, it has myrrh in it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and it is obviously significant, you know, then in Matthew, when the, when the um, astronomers, when the three um, uh, wise people uh, show up, um, they are bringing a gift of myrrh. Now, 
when they bring myrrh, it, it's, it's kind of like the, the precious stone that myrrh and it, that it is. And mm -hmm. then, and then myrrhon is, is made with it in it. Um, okay. But it, so it's not the same. Um, and, and the reason it matters is just because there's, there are plenty of references to myrrhon, but the, but they're always either about anointing for burial anointing because poor people deserve beautiful things or anointing and making people Messiah and Christ. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, that makes this passage so important. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but of course uh, the connection between Mur and Muran is, is, is there and, and is, you know, it's more or less saying the same thing, right? Mur we associate with royalty. We associate with, with, you know, abundance and beauty. Um, it's just that this goes the next, you know, the next mile and, and reminds us that, that there are these really deep social, economic, political implications of Moran because it's about, it's about finding a Messiah and, and Messiahs were many in this time. Um, you know, there were multiple Messiahs at the same time as Jesus, because what a Messiah was, was a social movement leader who had been anointed by God to organize society around the needs of the poor. Um, now Jesus is the one that emerges as, as God's true son. Um, and as, as that who is, is called to, to build a moral movement that can bring justice to, to earth. Um, and, and so that's really important, but, and that's what happens in this passage. Some folks are also asking questions to clarify what the good news is that's referenced by Jesus in that passage. Is there um, some good news he had already proclaimed that he was referring back to? Was there a pre-existing understanding of what the good news was among the disciples? Could you clarify that a bit? Yeah, so I think it's, so I think there's what you can do within Matthew and what you can do across the gospels, right? I mean, so if we're looking at the, the gospel of Luke, um, the inaugural sermon, of, of Jesus in Luke, in Luke four, is mm -hmm. the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. Um, uh, again, here's the anointing um, yeah. to preach good news. Um, again, evangelion to the poor, uh, to release to the captives, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, right? I mean, it goes into this whole quote of Isaiah. Um, yeah. So what were the disciples aware? Um, it's, it's, like they were aware that they were a part of a, a moral movement um, mm -hmm. that was religious and political and economic. Uh, they were aware that this was God's uh, special son who was born amongst the poor and homeless. They were aware that, you know, it wasn't supposed to be organized this way and, and that they had to organize themselves out of the chaos of poverty and dispossession. Um, I think it's when we write the gospels, when, you know, the communities of Luke and Matthew and Mark and John, you know, put these together, that then um, we see some of more of these connections about, about good news. But again, there's no place where Jesus is talking in Matthew that it isn't about, you know, um, setting up free healthcare clinics. I mean, that's good news. Uh, you know, freeing um, demons and, and, and those that are plagued by, by, you know, both despair and and also sickness, and and that's good news. And it, I mean, there there are always a material realities that are that mm -hmm. are in the conversation. But but I I, I don't know exactly how to. I, I, we more put the good news on on those passages than than um, than I, I don't know what the disciples you know fully heard. Um, but I do know that they were aware that that good news wasn't wasn't a spiritual concept that was about preaching that, you know, uh, if you take Jesus as your Lord and savior, um, separate from how you treat your neighbor, how you organize society around, um, uh, to, to overcome racism, uh, that, that was clear that, 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 that material liberative message was, was Jesus's message. Um, and that good news, that gospel was being, um, preached um, and taught throughout. One of our questions here is an interesting um, reflection on that, especially given the work that the, the Cairo Center does. Um, we, we have here that the Old Testament legal code was the only one that protected poor people instead of rich people. Can we adopt this law into US legal code? For example, how do we break the death cycle? 
which is policy. I mean, so, so talk a little bit about this. Is, is this just like, yeah, that'd be, be a really good idea, but it's not realistic. Right. So, so I, I love this question. I love this idea. Right. I mean, and, and, and we should, we should just say that out loud again, you know, that, that, that the Hebrew Bible legal code, like, you know, the commandments, the legal code, the, the instruction, you know, the Torah, all the different, you know, manifestations of it, that it, it is the only kind of legal code. It's the only set of policies in the ancient world that is about protecting poor people. Right. What empire does is protect the rich um, yeah. and, and, and what God's empire does, whether that's in um, Deuteronomy and Leviticus or Isaiah or here in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John is, is protect the poor. Um, and it is policy and it's not, and, and it was practiced, right? There's this whole debate about whether Jubilee is just an idea or, um, or if it was something that was practiced. Um, but what we have is evidence of when it's not being practiced, how mad some of the how, how mad some of the rabbis are. You know, Hillel yeah, has yeah. this whole treatise about, you know, people getting off track and not and forgetting God's commandments and these legal codes. You know, and and there's a lot of of kind of primary sources. Um, you know, in the Mishnah, in in a bunch of Hebrew texts that are all reminding the people and us that. That that God had a set of commandments, and these were these were legal codes, and 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 they they aren't just Leviticus and Deuteronomy, but the Deuteronomic code and the covenant code in Exodus and Leviticus. I mean, those are are codes. Those are sets of policies that that are intended to be realized and put in motion, and they're not just nice ideas. They're not just you know kumbaya. Let's all get along. They're they're like they're there to be enacted. Um, and, and so, yes, like when we're told in the Cairo Center and the Poor People's Campaign that what our goals are and what our agenda is, is too lofty. Um, and, and you're asking just for pie in the sky, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and the notion that you could forgive debts or that you could raise wages and that that would actually benefit and redound to the whole society. We can look at history and we can look at these codes and say, no, it has been done. Um, this idea that when you lend out money, never getting paid back, when you raise wages, when you forgive debts, when you release slaves, that that's what lifts your society up. Mm -hmm. We know that right now we're having this whole conversation about $15 in a union, right? Um, what we know is that 40 million people, if we were to have $15 an hour minimum wage, that would mean 40 million people overnight would, would, would get benefit from that. And that would bring close to $400 billion into our economy. That is going to then be spent in the small businesses, in our community. This is, so when you organize these kind of codes, when you lift from the bottom, when you, when you pay people what they deserve, then it, it doesn't just help them. It helps the whole society. And, and that's, that's absolutely what's going on in this text and in the text of our lives today. And in the fight for 15, it, that, what you've just described doesn't even account for the reduced um, reduce stress and anxiety of the people who now are standing on more solid financial ground, them being lifted out of poverty and perhaps off of different kinds of public assistance, which of course is economic ramifications. I mean, there's just so much that happens there, more stability for children so they can focus on their schooling. I, yeah, it's it's huge. Um, so the argument that people um, use that we can't afford it um, is by a very thin calculus, then it would seem. Right, and in, instead we should be saying we can't afford not to do it. Not to. Um, because the cost of it, you know, um, and Joseph Stieglitz has, has written about this, right? The cost of inequality <laughs> uh, is actually greater than the cost of, of ending it, right? It, it, it uh, we, this, the United States spends one trillion dollars a year on child poverty, on the fact that poor kids are 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 poor, um, and it, we would, for every dollar we spend on early childhood education programs and Head Start and these kinds of things, we save seven dollars in the future. Um, what you were talking about with the fight for fifteen, you know, untold lives would be saved. I mean, because of suicide, because of 
poor healthcare um, if we were to have this. And, and what we also know from this pandemic is that um, uh, when they less, lessened some of the moratoriums on evictions and some of the utility shutoffs, that the pandemic got that much worse. Like 400,000 more people got sick than needed to if they hadn't let up on those moratoriums on eviction. I mean, so there are real, and, and, and the people that got sick surely were some of the folks that were homeless, but we're, we're also other kinds of people throughout society. But so when we protect the most vulnerable, all of us benefit and, and the costs are, are so much higher of, of having this kind of level of racism, of poverty, of inequality. And the irony is that we've been calling exactly those workers the essential workers during this time too. Yeah, exactly. But then we don't allow for them to have the essentials of life, right? One of our people, so we're assuming that in this, in this gathering, um, we have people who come with a predisposition to be concerned about these issues. And one of our participants asks, so what do you do when you have people who argue that systemic racism and poverty are not real? Well, I mean, one of the things about even the passage that we've been talking about this evening is uh, for, for decades, for, for millennia, people have been saying the same thing about, about Jesus, um, that he wasn't poor, that, that there wasn't any inequality, that, that, you know, that those were better times, the Roman Empire was perfect. And, and so what we have in history is always folks that are going to deny the realities of, of injustice. Um, and, and, I, and I think we wanna to speak to them. Uh, and I think there's lots of ways to speak to them. I mean, one is to show people um, the, the stories of, of what is really going on today. Um, uh, I think inherently we're good people, right? And, and when we actually hear about, about those realities of suffering, and especially when we see that it doesn't have to be this way, um, that it doesn't mean that that someone who can barely afford their taxes is going to have to pay a lot higher taxes um, just to, to help lift someone else up, you know, because that's kind of what the setup in our society is, is that that we have to rob Peter to pay Paul instead of the fact that actually um, if we just had a slightly more fair taxation system, if we had you know, less money going to the military and actually making our world safer, um, that, that everybody could do better. Um, I think uh, then that would open up more people's willingness to, to see these issues. Um, but I also think um, it's okay for us to focus on, on those that, that have the ears to hear right now. Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, of course, we don't want to just preach to the choir. Um, but, you know, again, in a nation that has nearly half of its population in some form of poverty, um, and then you know, if you, if you look at like a study out of Cornell University that 80% of people in this country will at some point experience poverty, um, uh, then 80%, 80 that 80% of people, um, uh, of all of us will at some point in our lives, you know, either not have enough, uh, you know, will, will not have enough, you know, whether that means um, not having healthcare, you know, all these kinds of things, then, then, you know, starting with those that have the ears to hear right now works um, because it's not a small little tiny group of people over here. It's actually, you know, the least of the least of these is most of us. Um, it really is. Um, and so, you know, one of the one of the kind of stories we tell in our work is uh, it's kind of a cute little story, right? We're going on a little camping trip, right? And we're, we're in the woods. Um, and you know, in Pennsylvania, we know this. Um, and uh, we're at a, our campsite, and it's the middle of the night. And you know, there's a bear outside. And and what who the leader of the situation is is those who woke up first. Whoever saw that there's a bear knows what direction to run in the opposite direction of. That's who's going to lead. So so instead of us being worried about who's not in the room. Instead of us being worried about the fact that like not everybody gets this and has this analysis, let's start with those that, that are willing to have ears to hear. Doesn't mean that we only start with people that already acknowledge that racism is, is you know, an original sin of this nation. Doesn't mean you know, writing off people that, that really just think that um, these problems aren't, aren't 
aren't really important. But what I have found in my work, you know, is that as you start to organize, as you build this, um, people, people, you know, start to call and start to say, you know, I see this now. And, and yeah. so let's, so, so, so to me, there, there is a message and, and that is, you know, showing how it doesn't have to be this way and, and, and letting people see the real reality of, of what life is for so many people. But it's also, you know, celebrating those that have woken up already and, and, and working with them to, to, to keep going, um, to build more people into the work. Perfect segue for what's going to be our last question, which is how do those of us who wouldn't qualify as poor engage without disempowering the poor who are rightly leading this fight for justice? So, so indeed, if we look at history and if we look at the contemporary moment, um, those that are most impacted, you know, have to have a role and have to have a, 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 a big role, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, I, I love this quote from Frederick Douglass, you know, those who would be free must strike the first blow. Um, you know, mm -hmm. those in pain know when their pain is relieved, right? And, and, and he goes on to really explain and, and, and really rail against those that would say that the enslaved had no role in, in their freedom. Um, and he was constantly pushing up against that. Just like often many of us that are doing very grassroots organizing are constantly pushing up about the idea that, you know, that poor people can't organize and that poor people can't yes. do anything. Um, and so, so we have to we we have to believe and know and see that 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 indeed is happening that poor people are organizing, um, but it also has to be a massive movement, and therefore it has to have a place for everybody, um, because again, all of us are impacted. We might be impacted in different ways, but but we're all impacted by this, um, and that anybody that is hurting here means that everybody is at. at you know, at a vulnerability to be able to hurt. And so I think it's less about worrying uh, if I'm gonna step on people's toes too much. I mean, I've organized amongst um, very, very poor people for, you know, a, a quarter of a century now. And, mm -hmm. and I get put in my place when I, when I step out of line and, and, and I put people in their place when they've stepped out of line, you know? Yeah. So, so I think it's less about worrying about that and still just bring in the gifts that we all have because, yeah. because people have communities and resources, not just monetary resources, but connections. You know, if you talk about the issue of poverty, if you talk about racism, if you talk about marginalization, if you talk about issues that have been set to the margins and, and folks that are isolated. Um, and so just the act of coming together and building up something from across all of these lines is already an act of resistance and of liberation. And so, so we need everybody. Um, we need people uh, with, you know, with a lot of wealth and everywhere in between and people that are very poor and everywhere in between. And, and everyone has not just a role, but a leadership role as long as we also understand that those who, who, whose backs are against the wall and all they can do is push are, are gonna keep on pushing even when others you know, may not have to. Nice Thurman reference there too, backs against the wall. Um, this is fantastic. Um, we will be doing Mark 12, one through 17 next week. Um, I asked Liz before the evening started if she had homework. She would like folks um, on our call to look at the Poor People's Campaign website, particularly the 14 priorities. So Lori had dropped it into the chat a while ago. It, her, perhaps she can do it again before we sign off for the evening. And if you have found this evening to be useful and edifying and energizing, please, it's not too late for folks to register for the next three sessions. Um, just go to our website, pts.edu, and look under continuing education for difficult texts, and you can join us for the next three sessions. And those folks who register will have access to the recording of this night's um, uh, session as well. We'll be editing it down a little bit so it's a little bit more bite-sized so folks can use it for their uh, Sunday school or adult ed sessions. Um, thank you, Liz, for being with us this evening. I'll look forward to seeing you next week and uh, be well. And thank you, everybody else, too. God bless.